These models that Sailor has just put out are called Bitcoin 24 models. And my concern with them is that they're essentially a double exponential. That is, they use compound annual growth, but then they have this additional parameter to slow that growth rate down. And they end up having to require four parameters. Uh, first, they start with a growth rate, and then they decrease that growth rate each year in quantum fashion. And then they asymptote to a final rate. Mm -hmm. And then you have to have a fourth parameter, which is the scale or can be the initial fair value for the model. So the first question is, why do you need four parameters to have a robust model to explain Bitcoin? Okay, guys, welcome to another episode of 21st Capital. Today, I am very delighted to, to uh, talk with St Stefan. Uh, he's one of my favorite uh, follows on Twitter. He has been putting out a lot of fire content about Bitcoin models uh, from a physicist perspective, astrophysicist per perspective, um, a lot of valuable content. And he has done uh, lately uh, quite a bit of interesting work on Michael Saylor's models. Believe it or not, Michael Saylor has models now. The all models are destroyed mantra which we has which has been uh, sickening us is probably uh, out of fashion now and Michael Saylor has uh, models and as we will hear today actually he has many models an infinite number of them so today we uh, want to talk with Stefan to kind of you know take it apart analyze the models see where where the merits are and what are the criticisms and uh if we even have a better model okay so stefan do you want to uh take it over and introduce yourself and uh tell us what you got yes sina and thank you for having me on my name is stephen perino i'm a technology analyst at orion x that's orionx.net uh, i started out in astrophysics spent a number of years there and then moved into high performance computing. So I spent three decades in the supercomputing and high performance computing industry. And I view Bitcoin as a decentralized supercomputer. And I've got a whole nother talk on that. that maybe we can cover it another time. Um, I've been in Bitcoin <clears throat> since 2014. And I first used it really for money transfers from the US to Thailand. I've been living here for more than a decade. And it took me a few years to completely become orange pilled myself and, and to go down the rabbit hole. I would say I became a maximalist around 2017 after the, the blockchain wars occurred and we saw what the outcome was. And really what, what pilled me was reading the Satoshi white paper in the first place. and seeing the equations for the Poisson distribution as to how the blockchain gets exponentially harder and harder as you add blocks on, on to the end. So since that time, I've been writing about Bitcoin and uh, researching various aspects of it. And today I wanna to talk just a bit about the Saylor models. First of all, I'm a huge admirer of Michael Saylor. Uh, he and I are both alumni from the same university. Uh, I was there before him. <laughs> I'm a bit older, but uh, he's just been a fantastic voice. And of course, he puts his money where his mouth is. So what he has done to transform the balance sheet of micro strategy is, is amazing and phenomenal. And I, I own a few shares myself. So this is not a criticism in any way of Michael Saylor, but he's got some people working on some models for him. I don't know how closely he was involved. And, you know, we have some criticisms that we think are valid. And so we want to talk about those. I'm going to see if I can share. Okay, looks was... perfect on my side. Okay, I, uh, we, have our, we have our images and the slides. Go ahead. All right, well... There's another MIT alumnus, uh, Feynman, um, and a I also did a postdoc at MIT, so we can call it a MIT uh, alumni session. Go ahead. <laughs> All right, <laughs> this is great <clears throat> tech session. Um, so, I, 
it, these models that Sailor has just put out are called Bitcoin 24 models. And my concern with them is that they're essentially a double exponential. That is, they use compound annual growth, but then they have this additional parameter to slow that growth rate down. And they end up having to require four parameters. Uh, first, they start with a growth rate, and then they decrease that growth rate each year in quantum fashion. And then they asymptote to a final rate. Mm -hmm. And then you have to have a fourth parameter, which is the scale or can be the initial fair value for the model. So the first question is, why do you need four parameters to have a robust model to explain Bitcoin? The second concern is that there's no fundamental explanation as to why they choose these particular parameters. So it's a wholly empirical model. Um, there's something called MOND in the dark matter world. It's sort of like that. <laughs> the, the third one is that they end up painting a very broad swath of prices into the future. So they're all over the map, essentially. And we'll show that. So moving on to the third slide, this shows the four parameters that they have for each case. Uh, so if you look at that little extract, which comes from their Excel spreadsheet, and then I've labeled well, uh, yeah. what those are. So very good, very good. So yes. let's uh, let me give a quick intro to someone that has nothing, no background on this. So basically, Michael Saylor has this Excel sheet uh, just introduced August uh, 30th, like three days ago. Right now, we are we're recording on September 2nd. So um, what's in there is a bunch of assumptions for annual rate of return. So that's where he starts. He only begins making assumptions on annual rate of return of Bitcoin. Uh, and he has bear case, base case, and bull case. And you can see uh, bear case starts from 25% annual rate of return. Bull uh, ends up with 75%. But then he also realizes that this 25% or 75% they can't go on forever. So he kind of uh, has an intuition that the rate of return should go down. So he has another factor that reduces the rate of return year after year until it reaches a minimum. But for some reason at that minimum, he, he assumes, uh, he kind of, he, he assumes from that point on, it's going to be a fixed return. So that's what, what you see in the third row, 18%, 20%, 25%. So that's what it does. And then all the price predictions and everything else comes from this assumption on rate of return. Go ahead. Correct. Uh, that's a very good summary uh, and, you know, presentation of the core assumptions of the model. And But in addition to those rates and the slowing rate and the minimum rate, he needs one other thing, which is he has to start with some initial value. Basically, it's $100,000 at the beginning of next year. So let's move on to the next slide. Um, so with the bear, base, and bull, his three cases, so the base is the middling case. I am wearing my bull shirt, by the way. <laughs> we like bull. But uh, by, he, he projects out to 2045. And the bear case, he projects out to 3 million for the price point for one Bitcoin. The base case to 8 million. And the bull case to 49 million. So that's a price range of a factor of 15.4 over that time. So that is already for us a concern because we know what the parallel models, we can measure what the standard deviation, the volatility have been. And we do that in log space. So we take away some of the problems with the skew. We know it's still positively skewed, but we know what our, our constraints and our boundaries are, which are basically a factor of two on the, on the downside and, you know, Factor, factors of three-ish on the up, upside. So this graph plots his three models. And what it plots is the log of the Bitcoin price starting all the way from $1, where log 10 is zero, going up to above 10 million, where log 10 is seven, and starting from 2011, and running out to the end of his projections, which are 2045. And his three cases, the bear, base, and bull case are the red, yellow, green curves. 
And then uh, just to the, clarify, Michael yes. Saylor does not have anything uh, for, for the past. So his model only begins after 2024. So what, how did you, so you basically extrapolated it backwards as well to see how it would have performed in historical data, right? Right, I'm coming to that. So, you know, think of his model as he defined it as running from 2025 on to, to 2045, those curves. And then we've got the historical quarterly prices in this case with the blue dots. And I've added the power law, and this is a 5.7 uh, power law of time, time being of course measured from the Genesis block at the beginning of 2009. And that's the dash line, or the dash purplish mm -hmm. line. You can see that that fits the historical data quite well. And you can see that it projects to somewhere that's a little bit below his base case. So what I've done before 2025 is I extrapolated the same rules in terms of the annual increment or decrement in the growth rate. So I incremented to larger growth rates in the past for the prior 14 years. So in other words, if the base case had 50% for 2025 and it was increasing 2.5% per year, then you would go back to something like 14 times two and a half is, what is that? That's uh, 35%. So you'd, you'd have an 80% start rate. And actually Bitcoin prices early on were increasing much, much faster than that. So what you see is first of all, the curves invert so that the bull case is below historically, right? The bear case, because it's a steeper case, but even the bull case, does not really uh, go through the means of the price points very well. Uh, what we find is that the, you know, the yellow case kind of touches the early top, then kind of goes through the mean. That's the base case. The green bull case kind of goes through the mean early on, but then falls below as we go past 2015. And, and the red bear case is a really poor fit. And then I by know. The way, by the way, this is a lot of work for a few days since the model is introduced. So, you've also measured the the range the the range from the bear to bull at both ends, which is very interesting. Right. So at the starting point at 2011, uh, the price. Uh, <laughs> post diction, I don't know, extrapolating backwards in time, the, the price would have been about $3 in the bull case, and it would have been $3,000 in the bear case. So there's actually three orders of magnitude, a factor of 1,000 between the low end and the high end of the range. And typically when you have a model, um, the model works well on the historical data because people have it and they fit, force fit their model to the data. Now you have to wonder if the model has predictive value on new data, right? But, but in this case, <laughs> in this case, it's very, very easy because it doesn't even, um, easy to check on historical data because it, it doesn't even extend to that part. And I don't think any of these curves actually does a good job. Maybe the bear case, uh, maybe the base case kind of for some time, it's fine, but yeah, like yes. right after 2016, it, it begins to be, again, overly bullish. Yes. What else do we want to say about this? At, at the other end, it, as I've already mentioned, out in 2045, the dynamic range is a factor of 15 uh, between the bull case and the bear case. And, and we think that's kind of large. Uh, I guess, you know, if you go out and, and survey the Bitcoin world, people would probably not think that's, that is so large. But certainly with respect to the power law model, it's uh, a much larger dynamic range than we expect. We've been seeing the volatility drop. And in recent years, the volatility, you know, single standard deviation in log space has been less than a multiplicative factor of two. It's about 1.75. So explain what that means. What, what kind of low end and high end does that imply? Right. Well, uh, if, if you just use 
you know, the one sigma levels or the Z equals one levels. And if you were to say right now that the uh, fair value is around where we are in the 60 to $70,000 space, uh, then if the standard deviation is a, about, I'm trying to remember what it was in log terms, it, it was about uh, 0.27 or something and a multiplicative factor of 1.7. So you would say that the lower bound one Z equals minus one score would be about $40,000 right now, today. Uh -huh. And the one sigma upper would be around $100,000, right? And then the, the two sigma, which we occasionally hit because we're skewed uh, and we're skewed positively, we've got a very convex asset, which is nice. You know, that would be approaching $200,000 even today. Okay, so about I'm trying to find what's the multiplicative. Is it three? Um... It on on the high side. If you took, uh, you know, it'd be about the square one point seven, so it'd be about three. Okay, three. So essentially, what what uh, Steve is saying is, if you follow that dashed curve, which is the power law, um, by twenty forty five it probably goes down by by a factor of uh is it is it 50 percent like half or you mean what it, what would the volatility be the the standard deviation um yeah around I, it yeah well i'm not sure i i've got this kind of empirical model that also requires that you take some diffusion from all the little exponential peaks that we have the bubbles that we have about every four years um <clears throat> I expect for this epoch, it's going to drop below, well, for monthly prices, uh, it's going to drop below 20% for the standard deviation for monthly prices. I, I, I don't know. I haven't actually calculated out to 2045 what it would be. Um, so I, I don't want to. Yeah, but the standard deviations, uh, yeah, the confidence interval would just would be. Uh, uh, on, a, on a linear curve, it would be uh, stable, right? It's just a multiplicative factor that goes on. Although you can you can assume right. that it changes over time, but to, for simplicity, we are assuming there is a there is a fixed uh, um, distribution around the average, right? And I think you know I've looked at some of the prior work just to be not not super exact. It's it's about half, like or mm -hmm. like you said, it might change a little bit. But my point is uh, the power law model does not have a 15x range it probably has like 2x 3x range um and and this 15x <clears throat> after you know 21 years first of all mm -hmm. you know it's just crazy to try to forecast that long you know even if i have the best model in the world i will never do that but also um what he has uh offered is like you know multiple it's just an order of magnitude larger than a model like power law, which is itself very large, you know, 20 year, 20 years from now, you will have, you will have two X, three X uh, changes uh, in what the model might, might uh, give high probability to happen. Um, at that point, Bitcoin is as large as, uh, you know, a big portion of the world's wealth maybe as large as real estate, as large as the stock market, right? To also mm -hmm. have a 15x uh, range of possibilities around what it could be, that's that's how large this is. Um, it, you know, 15x when Bitcoin right. is, is at 1 billion market cap is very different than when it's the world money market cap, right? So, yeah. Yes. Yes, in fact, his bull case uh, is a thousand trillion dollars market cap in 2045, which is, you know, exceeds global wealth today. Now, global wealth in the future will be substantially higher, but that that's kind of where it's headed. And, you and that's see, a very important point. That's a very important yeah. point, because I was actually wondering that his bull case runs out of money <laughs> at some <laughs> point. Now, what yes. you say is uh, one thousand trillion uh essentially the bull case is already invalidated like just automatically by 2045 right because there won't be well, enough money in the world yeah unless you know ai causes growth rates that are nothing like we've seen in the past couple of decades right yeah. okay yeah yeah totally 
Okay. Uh, here's another way to show that the Bitcoin 24 model is not a power law. And what this graph does is between 2025 and 2045, it's essentially taking the power law tangent of the sailor base model at each year and saying, what would the power law index need to be to match the growth rate of the sailor model? And so what happens is that at first it rises up to around seven and then it plummets down to around five, but then he institutes his floor, which is 20%. And so it starts going up again and uh, it goes back up towards seven. Now for the power law model, we observe that it's just flat, you know, expected to be flat, has been flat for 15 years and we would expect it to be flat around 5.75 for another 15 years. It would be in this a straight line in the middle of this plot. Very so nice. So someone had, you know, had tweeted and claimed uh, that his model was falling a, following a power law and it, it clearly is not. But it's funny because the, you know, the base case, the base case numbers are close but not when you look at the full range, not when you look at look backwards. And also th those little deviations actually also show a pattern of gradually deviating further and further from the power law. So, you know, at the first glance from a distance, uh, the price predictions and the base case, as you were also showing, is kind of not, not extremely different, although mm -hmm. it's a log chart. So uh, it might actually be a huge numbers over time. But but this is amazing. I mean, this basically yeah. just if if you go back, uh, this uh, one, if you add the power law uh, line, uh, its parameter is fixed. It's just a straight line at uh, five point seven five or something, right? Right. Um, and uh, and there's beauty in 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 stability and having just a single parameter. Like the the curve you have here is like. <laughs> is very very complex you know it's at least it's a it's an inverted parabola that's two parameters and then right the, the why, why should it balance 20, it why should yeah. it balance in 2037 right <clears throat> so uh, what's nice about the power law is that yes the growth rates do decline but they decline in a regular continuous fashion so so it's basically you know they begin with some assumption and then it it turns out to be too much and and then they bounce it <laughs> they force it to bounce because uh, it just can't can't do that for for a long time so they they kind of change the game halfway to make it uh, more and more reasonable yeah right. go ahead okay so why a power law model for people who are still doubting the power law and why it would apply in the case of bitcoin nature loves power laws there are four fundamental forces in nature Every one of them is either a pure power law, as in the case of gravity and electromagnetism. And those are pure power laws over many, many decades. And gravity, you know, theoretically is a power law all the way down to the Planck scale, which is incredibly tiny. Electromagnetism, you know, down to the scale of the size of the electron. And, uh, you know, we haven't made, it's a point particle as far as we know. And then even the nuclear forces, the strong nuclear force, has a power law component. It's also a one over R squared component, but then it has this very stiff spring component that keeps the quarks confined inside the nucleus. And then the weak force has exponential terms as you would expect, because it's about decay, about how particles decay, but it's also got power law components as well as the exponential components. <clears throat> but so that's great physics, but how does that extend, you know, in, into the Bitcoin world? And the point is that even networks, both communication and social networks, obey power laws. And we see this, you know, in the telephone network, we see this in the internet, we see this in the sizes of cities, we see this in economics and the distribution of wealth, we see power laws in the sizes of lakes. Um, we see it, you know, in the animal kingdom uh, relating to the metabolism.
but particularly for networks, which applies to social networks, and Bitcoin is a social network and a communication network. It's actually multiple networks. A Metcalf's law can apply, and there, uh, basically, you have a, a square law where it grows as a square of the nodes. Now, Giovanni's talked about how the nodes grow, and that's how the number of addresses grow. And if you know historically, that's grown something close to the cube of time. So if you take that and you square that with Metcalf's law, then you get something around the sixth power of growth for Bitcoin itself. And that's what we observe, nearly the sixth power of time for the price. Yeah, it's, it's, it has amazing regularity to it. Um, it's just mind blowing. Yeah. So the power law has only two parameters. It has a constant, which is just, you know, what's the price at a given time along the trend? And then it has time raised to some power. And that time is measured from the January 3rd, 2009, from the Genesis block. You can measure it in days, you can measure it in years. Sometimes I like to measure it in block years. It really doesn't matter. You get slightly different behavior, but you get the same behavior. So for these two charts, the first chart is a log log chart. So it shows the log of price against the log of the number of blocks, uh, in this case, block years. And you see a very nice straight line, which is exactly what you expect for a power law. That's with the US dollar. That's price in terms of the US dollar. And that has an R squared of 0.95. And the green dashed lines, you know, show the 95% contour. So think of those as the two sigma uh, deviations. But you can do the same thing with gold. And for the gold plot, I've got the log of price against linear time. And this is calendar time from age two to age 15 and a half or 15 and two thirds where we are now. And with gold, it's, it's a very nice power law. The index is 5.5 and the R squared is almost the same. It's 0.94. So this one also answers questions about uh, adjusting for inflation and, and, and uh, those, those questions, right? Right. So you get a slightly lower index, you know, 5.5 rather than 5.7 to 5.8. Um, but basically the same sort of behavior. So it, the lens here is that gold is fiat. <laughs> why that should be i don't know but <laughs> it's it's being measured against its fiat. it behaves more like fiat than than anything else so if we take the power law and we project out to 2045 and in this case i've done it from today where we're we think the fair value right now is 70k um and then i've scaled so we're 15.67 years of age right now. And uh, we had 21 years to get to September 2nd, 2045. And then we take that ratio and we raise it to the 5.7 power, then the projection is $9 million from the power law. And if we say a factor of two up or down, uh, it'll probably be somewhat less than that as volatility will get compressed as more and more uh, trillions of dollars come into the market cap. But even with that, you'd have a range of four and a half to 18 million, a range of about a factor of four, uh, which is much better than a factor of 15. So what's nice about the power law is the growth rate slows down gradually and continuously. And it's just a basically derivative of the power law itself. So this answers my earlier questions, like, right? The 9 million prediction, um, you know, once you add the confidence band, it goes potentially down to four and a half and then up to 18. Uh, and that gives us a factor of four versus factor of 15. Go ahead. Right. Okay, last slide. Uh, Occam's razor is a principle that came out of uh, the county of Surrey in England in the 14th century. And there was a logician. I don't know how you earn the title of logician in the 14th century, but 
that's how history views him. He was also a Franciscan friar. So he would have uh, been in this church that's in Occam, Surrey. And uh, I lived in Surrey for, for a year, so a very lovely place. And for some reason, the spelling has changed. So it's now spelled with two C's instead of a CKH, but it's called Occam's Razor. And the idea is that the simplest explanation or the simplest model is more likely to be correct. Karl Popper said the empirical content is greater and such models are more easily falsifiable or they're better testable. And if you ask chat GPT reasons for using Occam's razor, it says simplicity and efficiency, minimal assumptions, greater predictive power, parsimony and science. So you can choose between competing hypotheses, which is what we're doing right now. You can avoid overfitting. I think we've shown that there are more than hints of, of poor fitting at least. Uh, and the philosophical grounding is a preference for elegance and simplicity. Yeah, so <clears throat> Occam's razor is um, <clears throat> kind of has two angles at least. Uh, one is like the I mean, a philosophical logical side of it, that simplicity is is better typically any uh, as you um, perfectly mentioned, any any explanation that is simpler has the advantage of you know it has less things to go wrong. Right, when you hear hear somebody like creating a complex story of why something happened, um, uh, that kind of always concerns me. Right, you 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 want to begin at least begin with the main um, mechanisms and the main forces in a system and. Uh, and Occam's razor basically emphasizes that, uh, you know, don't try to explain, over explain the phenomena, right? Mm -hmm. But also it has a second angle, which is a statistical kind of linked to the first thing. But in a statistical model, uh, we always want to go with fewer parameters because the more parameters you have, the more likely that the added complexity is capturing the noise. And once you yeah. capture the noise, noise by definition doesn't repeat. Noise is just noise, right? So if your model is is fitting the noise, it actually might look like it's fitting better. But over time, um, it will also try to kind of repeat the, that no, noise pattern, which is never going to happen. So it, it's going to get more and more wrong as you try to use that model. So that's another reason to use fewer parameters in the statistics. Very good. Okay, so uh, this wraps the discussion of Sailor's Bitcoin 24 model. Perfect. Do you want to give a conclusion or summary? Well, the conclusion is that the power law model fits history very well. It only has two parameters. The sailor models have four parameters. And then there are three different cases. So that's really 12 parameters, right? And so how do you choose where to go when you've got three sets of four versus one set of two? The simpler model is is what you would prefer to monitor and see how well it continues to hold in the future. And we've also got some fundamental explanation underpinning behind it that includes both Moore's law and uh, which I did not mention, and we don't have time to go in, into why, but it basically has to do with when the the miners, you know, when we suffer through a Bitcoin winter and the mining becomes, unprofitable, then that tends to put a floor. And then Metcalf's law that applies to networks. So it has some, and it, there are some additional arguments, you know, that have been made. So it has some very good uh, fundamentals behind it as well. Awesome, awesome. And it also has, a, a, a Sailor's model also uses an exponential form, which uh, doesn't fit the data uh, well, and what it does is over time, it becomes so, uh, so, so different from what you expect, then, then they have to kind of add other parameters to fix the deviation and tame it a little bit more and more. And that's still, it's like Band-Aid on, on, on an incorrect functional form. 
Awesome. We've well, thanks seen a lot. Seen I, this I, yeah. before. <clears throat> We've seen this before with stock to flow because stock to flow was advertised as a parallel model, but in fact, it converges to an exponential model with a compound growth rate of 69% per annum. It, it's a pure exponential as you go out in time. And, exactly. uh, and, and you see the just, problem over time. It just, it, yeah. it looks good in the beginning, but it deviates as, as it moves on. Yeah. Perfect. Well, thanks a lot. This was a lot of great work um, in such a short time. Uh, I loved your presentation and I look forward to chatting again.